So good afternoon to everyone, at least on the East Coast. Uh, my name is Moish Peltz. I am a partner um, at Falcon Rappaport and Berkman, which is a uh, full service business law firm based in the New York City metro area. Um, I head our intellectual property practice as well as our emerging technologies practice and um, which, which leads to a, uh, a great uh, background into NFTs and, and, and to our topic of our presentation today, which is going to be focusing uh, in, in part on emerging technologies and intellectual property, but, but more so on the, the artistic side of things, which is leading me to Juliet Yuan, who, who is our co-moderator of this panel. And thank you, Juliet, for, for joining us. Uh, Juliet is a New York-based, uh, well, is the chair of the New York-based art consulting firm, Juliet Yuan & Associates, uh, where she is a consultant specializing in post-war contemporary and digital arts. And her, fame, uh, her firm is based in the Upper East Side of Manhattan, where she provides boutique services to international clients, assisting them in building art collections and managing their passion uh, of assets uh, strategically. So Juliet, uh, thank you so much uh, for co-presenting with uh, me today. And uh, I'll turn it over to you to, to introduce our panelists and uh, the, the topic of our discussion today. Thank you, Moish. Thank you, Moish, for your kind introduction. And uh, good afternoon. And I don't know which part you are in, uh, in front of your screen, but uh, in New York, we're in the afternoon, 12 p.m. So good afternoon, everybody, for uh, taking your time and joining our panel. First of all, uh, let me introduce shortly our panel, what's about and what the topics we're going to uh, talk here, talk about here. So the art capital NFTs and the social values is a two part conversational event. So today we're having the first session and the second part will be on June 25th. We'll give further information when we end the panel. Uh, the program is co-presented by Falcon Rappaport Berkman PLLC law firm, Moish, I I wish that I uh, correctly pronounced your law firm's name. And also, yes, by uh, my own firm, Juliet Yuan Associate Art Consultancy in New York City. So our intention is actually to invite some experts from different sectors to review NFT's recent development and prospects together, discuss and reassess the digital arts definition, aesthetics and market value in crypto time especially how cryptocurrency and NFTs can contribute to art, the financial industry, the economy and human society. So as the blockchain technology and NFTs keep evolving, we hope that uh, this event will provide a platform for everyone here to share ideas and uh, perspectives, ask good questions, hopefully, rather than give definitive answers. So uh, now let me introduce our speakers um, we have the great pleasure of having some world leading figures from the mainstream art world uh, sharing their knowledge, insight and experiences working with blockchain technology and NFTs today with us. Sylvain Levy, I will start from our uh, world known art collector from France, along with his wife Dominique Levy, he is one of the principals of the DSL collection a major collection of Chinese contemporary art. Uh, however, well, in the contemporary art, Chinese contemporary art, there are many pieces that are digital art. However, from my knowledge, what makes Sylvain uh, really well known is not only the collection, but also his passion for cutting edge technologies and how he could always use the latest technology to present his museum online. We will explore further in the conversation. Um, next to Sylvain, we have uh, John F. Simon Jr. John is one of the pioneers in the development of software art. He is a renowned for, a, um, I hope I make this perfectly, articulating the use of code in digital and multimedia art since the mid 80s. And next to John, we have Claudia Hart, who is a pioneer artist in 3D animation, virtual reality, and augmented reality art. She is also a professor at the School of the, the Art Institute of Chicago. She has been active as an artist, curator, and critique since 1988. And we owe a special thank to Claudia Hart, who was um, 
actually not so well last night and she still joined us today. I hope you are feeling fine, Claudia. Okay, thank you. Okay, so uh, if our speakers uh, do not have any additional information to share with our audience, we will just uh, open our conversation. Sylvain, you are muted. Perhaps I shall say, uh, you know, in the Middle Age, there was something called uh, and ter terra incognita, uh, uh, unknown territories. And I hope that, and I think that uh, this discussion is for me, part of this unknown territories in which we are entering today, and especially uh, uh, from a point of view of someone who has been collecting for 37 years, I can tell you that uh, the, the new decade seems to be very different from what used to happen before. So uh, I'm very interested to listen to the other speakers because I hope that there will be a kind of lighthouse for me in this kind of unknown territory. I only know that uh, uh, Moish and I prepared a lot of questions for you. So uh, we will see how unknown we can go, we can push. Okay, Moish, do you have anything to add before we open the conversation? No, just that I'm thrilled. Uh, thank you for introducing everyone. I'm thrilled to have everyone here today and, and looking forward to kicking off. So Juliet, let's, let's get started. Okay. Okay. So there we go. Uh, to just remind of uh, everybody, remind everybody of the situation that we're facing in the past uh, few months. Um, the conversation actually comes from the major auction houses ground breaking sales on their NFTs which disrupted, that was the word that we see uh, the most often in the major media. Uh, the phenomenon disrupted the public consciousness, especially the traditional art world. It caused the complex feelings from uh, artists, curators, art critiques, galleries, and museum professionals. There was a lot of confusion, anxiety, and frustration, but at the same time, uh, we also feel a lot of curiosity, excitement, and hope. So along with all these agitations came endless and intense debates over digital arts history, market value, uh, and its impact on energy saving and environmental issues. Shortly after the NFT's explosion, many artists, curators, and gallerists in the mainstream art world were proactively engaged in discussions, exhibitions, and locked on different blockchain platforms to experiment with NFTs, also to reach out to broader collectors in new industries. So my first question goes for Claudia and John, uh, our two artist speakers. When did you start paying attention to blockchain technology and uh, NFT and experimenting with them? How did you react to the NFT explosion? And how did you position yourself in this turbulence of debates, manifestos, and movements? Whoever wants to start, you're welcome. Juliet, do you want us to show um, work while we do this or pure verbal? Uh, however you want to manage it in the most comfortable way. Uh, John, do you want to, I, I mean, I feel like I have to show pictures. Yeah, you should share work. Yeah. yeah. So um, anyway, then I'm going to share because I want to say that I started the interest in this um, with a body of work that I began a couple of years ago where I was uh, investigating issues about copyright and so tracing a line of history that has to do with forgery, copyright, identity, and then blockchain was the next. Um, before the panel started a few moments ago, we were talking about the NFT space as a gamified space um, and the players taking the role of avatars. And I'm gonna, keeping that in mind, um, I'm gonna show this, 
um, which is really where I started um, this body of work um, a couple of years ago, um, where to give a little preamble, um, I was I teach a class in the Art Institute uh, Museum in which with my students, we make, uh, augment, we use the paintings in the collection as trackables and make uh, augmented reality app, which we call the, I'm calling the romantic app, using the works in the collection and they integrate uh, animation and video and, and things in that. And I've been doing that for five or six years and we ran into walls that had to do with copyright. There was a lot of anxiety about infringing on copyright. And therefore, um, Gloria Groom, who's the director of the entire um, old wing um, at this point, um, she invited me into her wing telling me, you don't have to worry, we are all public domain. So uh, my students and I started working with impressionism and post-impressionism. And I found at that point that the linchpin in this whole story was Matisse and that Matisse, some of them were in the modern wing and some were in this historical wing and I didn't understand why. And Gloria told me it's about copyright. Matisse was the beginning of copyright in terms of artworks. Um, and Picasso is totally in the modern wing because it's all copyright. So I made a game. Um, so my piece, I did a show in the fall at Bitforms Gallery. I'd been working on the work for several years. It hit uh, when co the, it, then COVID hit, but I was already working on it. And um, I wanted to respond also uh, to, uh, and so I responded both to COVID and also to this research about copyright. And I made a kind of imaginary game in which I created a labyrinth and I'm gonna play a little of it. It was uh, imagining the game was a labyrinth of art history that we couldn't escape. And I, as the player was making uh, low res polygon models of masterpiece paintings by Matisse and Picasso and um, put them in a labyrinth that you enter but can never get out. So I'm gonna play a little bit of that. Um, the ultimate aim of all visual arts is the complete building. To embellish buildings with unfamiliar structures. Oops, sorry about that. Uh, I don't want yeah. to be rude, uh, Claudia, just yeah. as a reminder of the time, because we have one hour to um, all right. analyze the panel. Yes. I, all right. But this Thank is you. just showing it briefly, because the whole basis of the practice and my NFT practice is based on these little forgeries I made of famous paintings as low res polygon models. At that point, I decided, wait, I'm going to turn down the audio. Um, at that point, I decided that I wanted to sell the forgeries as authentic works of art, um, and that meant NFTs. Uh, at the, that point in the fall, the big boom of the NFT market hadn't quite happened yet, but I enjoyed this idea of the paradox that I could use the distributed network um, of the blockchain to create my imaginary forgeries of Matisse and Picasso still lives and um, make them authentic and unique by means of the blockchain, by means of making a token out of them. That was the beginning. And as I went further into this, I uh, went, went uh, it took over basically everything I was doing and I, became very obsessed and interested. So that was about starting from about two years ago. Um, I, for example, this was, uh, I was in that Christie's auction um, and this is my Matisse forgery um, that I made um, where I'm sort of, oh no, this wasn't the one in it. This was another, I made a couple of sort of translations of what, uh, of Matisse paintings. This is the one in, uh, Christie's was actually this one. 
um, and numbers of other works. Um, I've been functioning mostly on art NFT sites. That means uh, it's uh, that's part of one of the topics that I think we'll be talking about, which is the relationship of digital art, the tradition of digital art, and the new artists who've emerged in the context of the NFT platform. And I would say that um, you can find that also with the, there's a variety of NFT uh, platforms out there. And the ones that are dealing with, um, if you think of art as something that has a history and imagines a future and um, thinks about what, it's what the function of art is in the present and what it should be in the future, I think uh, you see artists who've been uh, making, um, I'm stopping, who've been working with NFT um, within that discussion since there were the first uh, NFTs. So for example, Kevin McCoy just sold his for the first NFT for a million and a half dollars in the Sotheby's auction. Um, but uh, there isn't a, any kind of uniform I would say blanket that you can put over the whole thing. It's just like with regular art, mm -hmm. is that you see a range. So, so I would, to recap, it sounds like for, for you, Claudia, that it, it was a natural extension of the art you were already doing. It was just yeah. a new way to exploit it, perhaps in a slightly different yeah. uh, medium. So John, how, how about you? What, what was your experience like in terms of coming to NFTs? Great, thank you for calling on me. I'm going to share my screen now. Uh, and it's so interesting that Claudia's trajectory through copyright, uh, I, I can present a different trajectory and also show that ideas that were present in work pre-NFT are now finding expression in NFTs. And I, I thought about it today. I think we're at a very similar moment to when we were in the early 90s when the web browsers were first uh, coming online and people were discovering they could share images on the World Wide Web. Uh, there were tons of images on people's hard drives and people were doing amazing digital art projects and all of a sudden there was an incredible way to share them. And I think now we're seeing in the NFT space that there's an incredible amount of inventory that is looking for a way to be distributed and and uh, the NFTs are providing that model. So I'm showing an early, early project. This is from 97. Uh, it was Every Icon. Uh, it, was a, it was a software artwork. Uh, it's still running. It's running now. And it um, basically goes through and shows every possible icon that can be drawn on a 32 by 32 grid, which is the original uh, Macintosh desktop icon. Uh, and just to... Uh, sum it up quickly to finish one line of all the variations of the icon takes three months and to finish up two lines of it takes 500 million years. So there's tons and tons of possible images out there to be done. It seemed like we could coin a lot of NFTs out of all these icons that are possible. Uh, so here it was, uh, and I tried to find a way to distribute it. This is in 97 and I made uh, applets uh, I made Palm Pilot apps, I made iPhone apps, I even uh, encapsulated it on screens on the wall. Uh, but, but what it was, was a piece of software, a piece of digital art that was looking for a way to be distributed. I sold, you know, hundreds of uh, every icon applets uh, and they were numbered uh, in an addition. So there was that kind of ownership, that value of ownership that NFTs give, uh, but there was no way for anyone else who had one to exchange them. There were a lot of barriers to that. And also uh, people did not expect to pay very much for software. So, uh, you know, there was, there was no uh, competition for the price. So this was uh, an, an idea that was out there roaming around. Uh, then uh, I turned to a project called Color Panel where I took another um, set of code and I encapsulated it on a screen onto the wall. And then I made, um, a set of these, sorry, this picture takes a second. Oh, there we go. Okay, so there's the, the set of 12, an addition of 12. This was a way to, again, I'm looking for a way to distribute software. How does software get out there? How does it get sold? How does it get uh, transmitted into the world? And the way to do it in a profitable way in 1999, when this piece was made, was to uh, take the whole computer, take it apart, uh, 
back it with plastic, put it on the wall and let it run that way. These were a successful piece. The, uh, every icon was in the Whitney Biennial in the year 2000 and color panel is in the collection of the Guggenheim Museum and, and the uh, Whitney Museum here in New York. Uh, so it was a kind of a novelty to have a way of distributing software. Also, it's really hard to explain that to have a flat screen, a color screen on the wall at that time was still a novelty. Now we walk around with screens, you know, this good all over. So uh, I will take over, John, I will take over the conversation from there. Uh, since you mentioned that your works are like Claudia, both you and Claudia, your works are among the permanent collections in really the most prominent museums in the world, such as MoMA, the Guggenheim uh, Metropolitan Museum, and, and among many others. So in terms of your uh, professional identity, I have a question. When uh, you know, when the three major auction houses define Beepo, Pack, and Matt Doc Johns as the pioneers and visionaries in digital art, was NFT a disruption for you and Claudia for your career? And uh, since you two as uh, pioneers in your own world, did you feel frustrated and challenged by the three auction houses definition on, dif on digital art and the NFT stars identities? Well, I, I have to say it was, for me, it was uh, quite thrilling to see that much attention being paid to digital work, which we'd been trying to get for a long time. And uh, I'm a believer that the uh, rising tide will lift all boats. So I think the more that's going around and the more it's talked about, the more opportunities there are. There's so many shows for digital work happening through NFTs. So I, I think it's a great opportunity. And how about I, I, I do too, totally. And I think it started with COVID because people obviously were in their homes and I was working a lot with social VR. So it was a way up, uh, people could gather within these artworks that I was making, game, these sort of game spaces that were interactive. Um, but it was not, uh, people were discovering, John, that there was digital art, but they still didn't think it could be monetized or didn't take it seriously. I was very busy pre uh, the NFT hitting. It was like the world discovered me, but they still didn't think they had to pay me. Um, and what's been amazing is um, that the, what happened with this big blow up was that the shock of it was that we might be um, the scarcity principle that we, the block distributed identity on the blockchain ide as identity of uniqueness and the authenticity and the aura of uniqueness could be applied to us. And I think I, I shocked a few people when I said, oh, by the way, I'm taking back all my social VRs and because I'm going to put them on the blockchain. Mm -hmm. And the, so I think, you know, the idea mostly, I'm just talking, I'm looking John right in the eye, though you can't tell, is that like we existed, but not in the same way because there wasn't money attached to us. And that's the culture that we are in. And so we were given second class status. Mm -hmm. And I, so he, yeah. yes, thank you. So here, I'd like to engage Sylvain in our conversation. Uh, actually, in the past months, um, there is a key question for me, maybe not for everybody, but it was a key question for me uh, that was not so much mentioned by uh, the art media. Maybe it was avoided intentionally. I'm not sure. So I really would like to have the answer from you, especially Sylvain. Uh, do you think it's a moment with NFT involved in the digital art now or an extension? Um, do you think it's the moment for us to, um, uh, or is it indispensable for us to redefine what is digital art, digital art now? It's about the definition. Is it necessary to do that? How do you understand this uh, transition? Silva, would you like to open the conversation? I think that uh, first it's interesting to, to define what is art today uh, before defining what is digital art. It's interesting to define what is a museum today. I think that uh, we have to, uh, I think, uh, re, uh, re uh, I should say, not reinvent, uh, but at least to update uh, what is art in the eyes of uh, the consumer 
or the art of uh, the public. Uh, coming back to what you say, I think it's, uh, it's, it's interesting. It's interesting to see how uh, things happen. You know, uh, uh, you say that uh, some of the digital world works were already in museum, but it's not the institution who has institutionalized uh, these works. It's the market. It's, mm -hmm. it's the social, social networks. So it's interesting to see that art today is how art is made and how art is disseminated and how art is valued. And I think this is very important is that we have changed the way, uh, the traditional way where I shall say art was, uh, I shall say cooked from the producer to the consumer. Uh, if I can speak in a, in a very, uh, perhaps in a very vulgar way. So this is my, my first reaction to your question. But I think that one thing is very important for me. Uh, and you know, um, what, what we've been doing with the SL, if I can speak a, a few minutes on, on the collection, a few minutes, uh, since 2005, we, we tried to speak the language of our time. This is why we went digital. This is why in 2005, we went on internet, then we went on second, uh, we went on 2D Museum, 2D Museum, Second Life, uh, uh, virtual reality, games, and today social VR platforms. Because we think that uh, we have to, to speak the language of our time. And the language of our time is, is the digital in a certain way, and more than in a certain way. Because today, uh, Juliette, you and me, and all the people here, we have a digital twin. And this digital twin spends between four to six hours in a digital world. It's called now the metaverse. And in this metaverse will happen a lot of things with different types of emotion and different types of desire. And the digital work is part of the NFT will be part of this metaverse. I don't know how, but it will be part of this metaverse. Like the Gucci NFT was sold in a kind of the metaverse, I shall say a word. So I think it's part of the way that the society is evolving, but uh, it's like this that I look at NFT as a way to try to mirror the new, I shall say, the new human being, which is being, I shall say, created with this, I shall say, new digital world in which we are living, this metaverse in which we are living. Uh, I would like to uh, follow up with your comments on um, the uh, interaction between institutional art and the art market, Sylvain, because today what's happening and what's fr what frustrates the traditional, if I may use this term, because we, we really don't know how to define uh, the, the different sections between crypto art and digital art, we used to know. Um, I think everything is evolving, so the definitions are evolving as well. Uh, however, what frustrates the uh, traditional art world is actually the market, because the market is, is really going crazy uh, just with the, the auctions, and uh, it's pretty dominating, uh, especially for the, the traditional digital artists' careers. Um, so uh, if I may track the records a little bit, take just one minute to track all the auction records, uh, we have uh, Christie's who uh, had, which had uh, six auctions until today. Uh, with, uh, of course, the highest record was Beeple's uh, collage sold for $69 million in March. And uh, Phillips had one, uh, very humble, uh, with M Mad Doc Jones sold for $41 million. And uh, Sotheby's uh, actually just closed their recent uh, auction, uh, the Native Digital, yesterday. Uh, with Kevin McCoy's quantum, uh, the work name quantum as the first NFT uh, that was sold with 1.4 million. Anyway, I'm not going to repeat all the big numbers, but uh, the phenomenon between the crypto art world and the digital art world that we used to know uh, is also this big market value. There is a big gap between the crypto art stars and uh, also the traditional digital artists works no matter how pioneer they are in their own world. So my question is, how do we understand as your collector, 
maybe you do have the answer, maybe you don't, but I'd like to really hear how you feel about this gap, the, the value of the digital art, mar, uh, digital art. Uh, especially imagine if I were a collector, I'm, I'm new and I'm interested in collecting some digital art pieces and I'm your friend, Sylvain. I come to you, I ask you, Sylvain, you are expert in digital art. I'd like to buy, start collecting digital art, but how should I start? The, 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 the prices are so, so uh, the price range is so large. How should I understand this? But I will tell you, uh... A very simple example, an example for, for the, the collection. We just collected the first uh, NFT. Uh, uh, so, uh, and I will explain the process that we, we, we've done. Uh, first, uh, we, uh, you know, we made our homework, uh, you know, like everything. We, we take our time. I think, uh, you know, life is uh, plenty of time. There is plenty of artists, and so we don't have to hurry. You know, uh, I think uh, managing time is something very important in the collection. And uh, there was an exhibition organized in Beijing by Li Zhenhua uh, and with uh, Crypto Z Air. And uh, Li Zhenhua is one of the, the, for me, the most uh, I've been working, I've been following for at least 15 years as a curator, especially of digital art. And so when he made this exhibition, with this artist, we collect the work. Because we believe that if Lee Genoa has decided to create an exhibition like this, with this artist, it means that the work and the artist, perhaps they are using NFT, but they are also, I should say, artists in the way we conceive what is art. So I think that once again, if you look at the NFT through the crypto money, if you look at the NFT through the hype, uh, you will have another way to look at things. If you look at the NFT as a, a way to discover a new type of medium used by, I should say, even traditional artists, uh, perhaps it's coherent with a collection. And we will stay in this way to look at NFT. It means that for us, and coming back to the difference of prices, you know, even in the, in the art world, there is many difference of prices between, I shall say, the usual suspects and the others. So I don't think that the NFT is, uh, is you know, is, uh, is immune in this kind of the winners take it all uh, position in the, in the art world. So uh, it's just, you know, a, a mirror of uh, the way how the market is built and by whom the market is built, uh, whatever it is. NFT or the other things. So, uh, you know, no, it's okay. They made 68 million. I'm happy for the seller. I don't know if I'm happy for the buyer, but it's, it's not my problem. You know, it's okay. It's his money. If he's happy, I'm happy for him. That's it. <laughs> I don't, I'm, not, I'm not going to change my way to look at things because of a number. Thank you, Sylvain. Um, before Moish takes over the conversation, I have my last question for the two artists here. Uh, since we are talking about the market, so we'd love to know how you manage your NFT business today. Um, I noticed that, that uh, John has been very low key since the beginning. Uh, maybe you want to share why you chose to be low key uh, with the NFT movement. And Claudia was proactively engaged in uh, uh, all sorts of events since the beginning. And you both are uh, locked on some different uh, blockchain uh, platform to experiment with NFTs. So how is your experience uh, today? And um, my question is, do you feel the NFT brings you more freedom and power as artist? Did it increase actually your sales and bring your new markets and collectors? Do you, do you think that you need to adjust a little bit your aesthetics to provide different artwork to adapt to the NFT market's needs and collector's tastes, or you can just remain the same, provide the same artworks. Uh, I, I can say that I, I mean, I'd sort of like to show the work that I am talking about because it's so abstract, but for me, because I was dealing with identity, 
and um, my work took a feminist and still does position. Um, I was very interested in blockchain, not in terms of market, but in terms of ontology, that it, it's a way of defining truth through inscription in, uh, in a distributed encrypted inscription on the ledger. The ledger is what they call the distributed network of the blockchain. And through that, you could also um, um, write yourself, write your own identity within that. You actually legally can. And I was very interested in the smart contracts. I did something called the Feminist Manifesta on the blockchain, and I posted it on Instagram, and it has then became part of a, an NFT. It's been written about and published um, a lot and keeps being so because I was thinking more about um, identity and identity politics. That's why, and uh, the idea of authentic authenticity and truth. So for me, it's a big cultural shift about that. And vis-a-vis uh, -vis the market, um, COVID changed the market for me anyway, um, because of the interest in virtuality, um, generally in terms of art. And I wouldn't say the NFT made more or less difference. The big shift is in the larger art world as discovery of digital art. And I, I wanna just close by saying, I was on a panel, several panels, and I was on a very high, highly attended panel because Jerry Saltz and Kenny Schechter were on the panel and it was um, done by the Smithsonian. And people wrote me after in the audience saying things very sweet, but surprising to me saying, I knew there must be something like that out there. I knew you must all exist, meaning digital art. I knew that it was artists or people within the larger art community who were discovering for the first time that there must that there, and there are a few galleries and a few specialists, but it was a closed, a closed, more um, privatized space, the digital art space, and now it's not. John, would you like to take it over? Sure. Um, my, I would always make a distinction in my work between. Um, code-based, software-based work and uh, video work. Um, and it's always been really important to me that the artwork uh, has a living quality, that it's actually computing what you see. So I never um, regarded the still images or the video images um, much more than a record of that. Uh, but um, seeing in the NFT space that people were willing to pay uh, for uh, a single still image, which I'm not sure I still get, but I, I get a little better because uh, my uh, son is a, a video gamer and he showed me the um, um, Steam community market and places like that where th th that generation is very comfortable collecting and trading completely digital items that are not useful, for instance, in a game. They're just cosmetic, uh, but they have some value. They have some rarity and they're changed for real dollars. So I can I can kind of see it. So I, I began to sort of understand that. Then I had a series of conversations with a good friend of mine, Mark America, who might actually be here uh, today. And um, we sort of puzzled the thing out because uh, yeah, NFTs were out there, but um, uh, did they really fit the work? Uh, and then there was a sort of a wave of putting um, older work. So I have a number of pieces on uh, OpenSea and on Rarible uh, where uh, I've taken um, vi videos uh, of software running that I've made and uh, digital images I've made to see how they looked in the NFT space and how they would uh, um, play out and be received. And then I started to look at old software and how it could be um, uh, changed and incorporated into uh, uh, the medium. And I was um, doing things like filming software on the screen and processing videos. So my piece on foundation is a, is a kind of a processed piece. 
And it turned out they're drawings that I make. I'm a, a daily practitioner of drawing. So they're drawings that I make that uh, also could have a digital distribution. So maybe there's a way to take some physical works and use them. So I would, I would take the works that were already scanned and process them digitally, which was really kind of interesting experiment because I would never have done that before because there would never have been a way to distribute that before. So all of a sudden, the base image, which is done with gouache and pencil, uh, uh, goes through a process where, where I'm thinking about it as completely digital image and then presenting it uh, that way and distributing it that way, where before really you'd never thought about distributing a single frame. Uh, and lately I've discovered the site Hick at Nunc, which um, some of you may know about, which is a kind of obscure, I think kind of an artist's artist site, uh, which runs on the Tezos blockchain, which is a greener blockchain. It has a lot of good qualities. Also the prices uh, uh, at Hick at Nunc are uh, like uh, $2 uh, for it and artists trade with each other. It's more like a swap meet for artists than anything. But the most exciting part of the Hick at Nunc uh, project is that uh, you can um, coin or you can mint a, an NFT that is uh, uh, code. So you can write in the P5JS, which is a variation of the processing language, and you can put that in a package. And so I've been experimenting with taking the little code snippets, which really would never have had a home. So you could think about every icon and color panel and things I was showing. Mm -hmm. And the little code snippets, they can actually live, be a living piece of code, ch always changing, never repeating kind of um, process. Uh, and it can be now uh, turned into NFT. So uh, NFTs could become uh, uh, apps. Uh, it could become uh, places themselves of exchange. So that's sort of interesting. So for me, I'm not, uh, I mean, of course, everyone likes to be popular. Everyone likes to make a lot of money. But uh, my uh, daily practice is really where my artistic growth takes place. And the degree to which I can incorporate that into well, it's a really a means of distribution. The, 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 the principal change that I see when NFT came out was that there is a decentralized way of distributing and exchanging artworks where uh, a, a greater fluidity and greater transparency than there ever was online. Uh, and I think that's, that's really exciting and the cryptocurrency really makes that possible. So that's where I'm at. Thank you, John and, and Claudia and Sylvana. So I'm, I'm, I'm a little bit almost surprised because my, my, my thesis coming into this is that, and, and speaking with Juliet is that there was some uh, digital divide, right? Where, where there's perhaps a, a, tra a traditional digital art world and uh, the, now there's this NFT world and you have you know, people in pack and, and there may be some, uh, you know, I, I, I wasn't sure if it had been, maybe art has never been, you know, there's, there's different schools and there's different things like that, but it seems like for at least for the, the two of you, um, it, and, and for me, for, for, for Sadaq as well, it's been a very natural extension of the digital artwork you were already doing in terms of either creative uh, or, or collecting. Um, so my, my question would be, you know, what about the NFT space perhaps is, uh, offsetting for you? What, what, what concerns do you have? Uh, what, what about it do you not like? I mean, for example, is the, is the focus uh, you know, purely on the commercial aspect of it? Is, is, that, is that overwhelming to some degree? Um, or is that just always <laughs> the, 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 you know, in, the, in the back of your head as an artist or as a collector? Um, so I'm, I'm wondering just the, in terms of downsides, things you don't like or things that you're, you're hoping will be uh, improved or resolved technologically or you know, things like that. Maybe John, just kicking it back to you to, to speak on, on that and we can then cycle through everyone. I think the primary criticism everyone has is the environmental concern. And it's, it's, a, it's a very important uh, concern and has, has to be addressed on most of the blockchains. Uh, so first, first and foremost, yeah, proof of, um, proof of work has to be looked at. <laughs> um, um, second of all, instability of crypto, which may work itself out eventually, but uh, uh, the fluctuation in the uh, currency makes it difficult to know when to release, and and the and the busyness of the blockchains makes it hard to um, uh, mint sometimes because the gas fees are very high. That kind of thing. That's a concern. Another is the smart contracts are all really great, but they don't always enjoy cross. Uh, 
compatibility with the different platforms between uh, Rarible, Foundation, OpenSea, et cetera? Are there ways to get around the um, royalties and things like that and to break those contracts? And so, and I don't know if any of these have uh, really been tested legally. I don't, I don't know the degree of it, but I think we call it a contract, but we don't really know. You, you would be the one to ask about that. <laughs> uh, the, how, how legal is a smart contract? How enforceable is a smart, the royalties in a smart contract? And, and how uh, deeply can we get into it? I mean, as a coder and, as the, and looking at a smart contract, I'm interested in like, the things that they trigger, the uh, things that, that you could write into a contract in the future, the kind of timing things, that the sort of code based things you could write into it. I don't know how legal it is or how possible it is. So that's one limitation sort of on a more personal level. Yeah, definitely. Those are all really good um, thoughts. And yeah, the, the legality of it, right, from a uh, intellectual property perspective, and um, even from a contract, right, you know, cl click wrap being, you know, if I check a box and, and, and accepting those things. But uh, the same same thing from uh, John, from what you were doing with with uh, you know the the, the I don't know if it's thirty two by thirty two blocks and, and generative art, right? Um, so much of what I find interesting now just seeing the different projects are, are, are the NFT projects and that, that have the entire NFT, the entire artwork exists in the you know, Solidity contract, right? So to, to, to some extent that is, uh, um, it, it's solving, right? It's a public distribution of what you were doing, but instead it's distributed instead of, um, it's, it's, so it's, an, it's, it's almost a new container for something you, and anyways, I think it's really fascinating. Um, Claudia, how about you concerns? Uh, uh, well, what John obviously, said. I think uh, I can address what John was saying about the eco problem in the same response, um, because one of the things we see, the problem, uh, one of the problems for me is the idea of putting the work up, that there's this comp, uh, the auction, the auction. So here you put it like it's all on the meat, like meat on the auction block. There's the idea that the selling is based totally on currency and it shows lack of respect for the work. So in response to that and the issues of the eco, um, what I am seeing happening is that um, galleries who have specialties in digital art or um, uh, nonprofits or uh, artists run space, a whole variety of these spaces, have been developing direct, um, they're using their own sites and using, for example, Monograph, which is uh, Kevin McCoy, Kevin and Carlos's um, platform. So to write smart contracts, which have legal uh, recourse and then distribute by the gallerists themselves. So you have somebody outside of the auction place and then the choice of using POS and um, 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 economic blockchains, right? A POS blockchains. So it's all wrapped together in one big mush, the legal, the eco, and um, the commerciality that this confluence of the idea that selling art has to do with this auction, 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 money, 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 and not as Sylvain was saying, when he buys something, it's re he takes time and research and communes with the work. And, you know, usually, so art is not the same as a, I don't know what, you know, it's self-reflective. That's what art is. And, um, it's not the same as a sneaker or, you know, it's just not because it's self-reflective. And yeah, that's it. Sylvain, would you? Yeah. Uh, it, perhaps I would be very, uh, I mean, perhaps I will have my feet on the earth as someone who, uh, you know, is involved in the art as someone who collects, it means that, uh, I, you know, I buy something and I want to, to keep it and perhaps to transmit it in one way or another. To tell you the truth, uh, what made me today uncomfortable, but uh, perhaps because uh, I'm, as I said, you know, into uh, my homework period. I think there are 
for me, the way I understand the situation today is that uh, you can have art being uh, created by a computer or by whatever uh, digital way. And this art already, we know how it can be protected and how it's protected and how it's valued in one way or another. We know how uh, a video or, uh, can be protected, whatever. We know, we know that. We have been already uh, to uh, the music and the, 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 the film industry, we have a kind of protection and we know how we can manage with that. You know, the problem today for me is very simple. When I buy an artwork, okay, today I can show my artwork wherever I want. I can loan it to a museum, I can put it in a VR, I can do whatever I want. Imagine that I buy an artwork, but someone else buy the NFT, the digital image of the artwork. What happens with my freedom to show the work? What happens? What happens today we go to museums and we can take photos of artworks? What ha happens tomorrow when someone will go to the Uffizi Museum and take a photo of an artwork which has been sold as an NFT? See, what is the consequences in terms of disseminating and democratization of art? And this, for me, uh, is, uh, is a big concern, is a big concern, because I think that we have to protect the artist naturally, but also an artwork is made to be disseminated by nature. And if you put, I shall say, a lawyer behind every artwork, I think the game is not at all the same. And I don't think that I'm going to play this game. I prefer to play golf than to do something like this. Art is for me a way to enjoy my life as not a way for me to have, I shall say, headache or to look at things in that way. So I'm in a very, you know, I'm still waiting to see what will be the reaction of the artist in the future. And they will say to me, okay, I'll sell you the artwork, but I don't sell you the digital artwork. And this would be a problem for me. So I follow up with your conversation, uh, your opinion. Actually, it reminds me of several cases, especially with the Banksy, burnt Banksy event. And also recently, uh, the uh, uh, was it Basquia or another Banksy that was sold at Christie's? And then uh, the seller was encouraging the buyer to destroy the real object in order to increase the value of the uh, NFT, the image, and also- it was yeah, Basquiat, yeah. yes. So another case of Basquiat, that was the question I prepared for Moish, actually. It wasn't directly related to Sylvain, uh, the, the, the case that Sylvain mentioned, but it was um, close, which was the NFT of, of, of Basquiat's drawing, Free Comp with Pagoda, has been withdrawn from sale on OpenSea uh, directly from the blockchain, uh, blockchain platform after the late artist estate confirmed the seller does not uh, own the license or rights to the work. So all these images, the, the rights between images, seller, buyer, and the images and the uh, real object, all these things are very confusing now. Uh, would you, Moish, as you were the only lawyer on this platform, <laughs> if you could provide some advice or guidance to us, that would be great. Yeah, so I, you know, it's it's interesting, right? Because there's there's, as Sylvain knows, right? There's there's you know, speaking about there's almost hundreds of years, right? Of of norms and history of of how you collect art and what it means to own an art and the 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 implied rights of being able to display it or to uh, put it in a museum or things like that, right? And so there 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 is a vacuum, right? So I don't think I have all the answers. Like I can I can guess and use educated. Uh, you know, this is how it works in, in one context and it works on Instagram and embedding and things like that, right? So we have case law there, um, but there isn't a, a in the US, <laughs> there isn't like a, a, a statute. There isn't a jurisdictional decision saying, a judge saying this is what happened in this context and things like that. So, you know, we were looking at the, the Basquiat, right? The, the, there was a purchaser of a Basquiat, I believe the Pagoda painting or uh, drawn at auction and, and they took a photo, a digital, made a 
a, a duplication of, of the underlying work and created an NFT with that work and put it up for sale. Um, now they put it up on, on OpenSea and um, the, the estate of Oscar went to OpenSea and said, you know, that the person who listed this doesn't have the right to do that. And there's all sorts of, you know, they're, they're using the Bosco name and in uh, and, and, and selling this and, and things like that. And so they objected and OpenSea took it down and um, the, the seller seemed to acquiesce to that. And, and that was that, right? But um, I, I don't think we really um, have seen, you know, what, from a legal perspective, what, how these rights are gonna, like how, how everything's gonna land, how it's gonna fit. I think we have uh, guesses, and we can project forward. You know what what the past has has shown us, and what those norms are, and and try to imagine that those norms will remain in the future. But there is so much about what is happening uh, on the blockchain that that is meant to be open and distributed, and to be. Uh, pseudonymous and resistant to being shut down, that I think it it raises a lot of questions as to, you know, sure, if you're a, a large platform and you're subject to U.S. regulation, you don't want to be sued to oblivion, you're probably going to do certain things as, as a practical matter. But so much of this is, it, the possibility is to be completely open and to be re, uh, resistant to take down, to, to be uh, not subject to, um, you know, your jurisdiction or, or even if subject to jurisdiction here that uh, if a federal judge says this must be taken down, who is the centralized authority that is going to follow that order, right? Um, so there, there's, and, and so I, I think as artists, right, there's a lot that, as we've been talking about for the last hour, that that creates this, this huge open opportunity and as, as collectors and commerce to, to create new things and to, you know, create generative art that exists on the blockchain. But that also, the, the flip side of that is, well, uh, once it's out there, uh, you know, one, what legal rights control, and two, if, if something goes awry, how, how do we put Pandora back in the box? So I, I, I can guarantee you, uh, you know, <laughs> lawyers will be grappling with this uh, probably to the great consternation of, of Collectors like Sylvain that are saying get get out of the way and, and let us, uh, but but I I, I think um, it, it for for me it's it's the huge issue um, I, I I don't I don't think it's going away uh, of of this ownership right this question of uh, which I think is also related to you know proving authenticity right which is one of one of the the largest benefits and also I think the, one of the biggest concerns about you know is, is you're able to duplicate anything anyone can duplicate anything. Right, you can go to a gallery and you can take a photo and you can make an NFT with it. Doesn't mean that you're uh, Matisse, right? Um, but the, and the, all these issues are interrelated, and I think tie back to the commercial aspect of it and to the artistic aspect of it. And I think it's you can't sever the legal from from those issues. You know, if I can just add something to what you said, uh, you know, uh, as I said before, the relations between uh, an artist and a collector was based on the idea of a fair use of the artwork. I think what is important is the fair use. How do you use the artwork? Uh, and, uh, and, and what I'm a little bit uncomfortable is that we're going to move from something which was quite flexible uh, to something which will become much more difficult to manage as a collector. And I don't think it's, Really, uh, you know, I was telling you that we are entering enter into terra incognita. I think we have entered into a territory that uh, we don't know exactly what will happen uh, for an artwork and how an artwork will, what would be the life of an artwork. And this, for me, uh, concerns me a lot as a collector because, you know, once you have collected the work, and once you use this fair use notion, I think a collector should be free to do what he wants to do with the artwork. And if you take out this freedom, I think you take a big part of, I shall say, the value of an object. 
And this, for me, is the biggest issue for the next years, to tell you the truth. Then I have a question for you, Sylvain. If this becomes a big concern, as you just collected your first NFT piece, how are you going to use it? You know, I've collected because uh, I like the artist. I've collected because I like the curator. And that I think is the passion that, part. No, it's not the passion. Can... You know, you know, uh, you know I, I'm very cautious with the notion of passion. I, I think that the collection is also something more than passion. I think it's a, a, it's a way to, to uh, through an artwork and through an artist to vision a society or to be challenged or to, to put questions on the table. And I think that with this exhibition, uh, uh, Cooking Cooking uh, in Beijing, I think uh, that uh, uh, Jiang Ying made a, a lot of issues on the table, put a lot of issues on the table. So I, I don't know what would be the value of this artwork and I don't really care. And I don't really care because, you know, uh, it's now for a long time that I consider that uh, collecting is an elegant way to burn a fortune. Uh, and I don't think that uh, uh, I, with, with the way we collect, especially, you know, big works, uh, big installations, not very marketable works, uh, I, I don't think that it's the good way uh, to look at the collection as an investment. And so this work is part of the, the vision that we have uh, of the works that uh, are relevant for us, but it's just a, a personal position, uh, with the works which are relevant for us in our journey as a collector. And, uh, and we'll see, we'll see. Uh, I think it's a very interesting, for me, it's a very interesting way to enter into this new world, perhaps with the uh, old ideas and uh, and makes me feel comfortable because I feel comfortable in this coherence between the new world and perhaps what could have been the old world in the way we collect. Mm. Can I jump in for a sec? Please. Yeah, because uh, he, uh, Sylvain makes a great point uh, when he says uh, that he's collecting it because he wants to support the artists, that he likes the artists. And I think that um, it gives us a way to think about NFTs not as um, things in of themselves as uh, that we're collecting them. But one way I like to think of it is like shares of stock. Like when a business issues shares of stock, they, um, they do it in order to raise capital to produce more of what the business does. And so... Uh, we, we think of an NFT this way, the collector is then investing in the career and the uh, business of the artist to give them capital to move forward and to create more work. And uh, the shares of stock are pieces of paper, you know, they're symbols, uh, uh, and they themselves don't have any value except to, as they're tied to the company and as the company grows, but they, they can increase in value like the NFTs that you hold in an artist. So. I think it's a kind of a patronage model, maybe like uh, becoming a Patreon, but uh, actually having a, a token uh, to go with it. And, uh, and it's a nice way to think about. And I think that uh, and there's a, a question about why some artists or NFTs are valued more highly than others. And I think some of it has to do with the fan base and the fact that those fans want to see that artist uh, continue. There's a great uh, volume of people that, uh, that uh, can support that work. And so sometimes you see large edition uh, NFT sales uh, for smaller prices, uh, like a big IPO going uh, for support of those artists and they just want to do it uh, for that kind of support. And I think that's a great way to think about NFTs on that level. Yeah, I actually did that with the piece um, on Feral File where it was a very large edition and you bought a share. You could look at it if you had the share and you got a stock ticket which was my manifesto which looked like an inscribed a page of an old illuminated manuscript or something so you and that gave you the right to share screening and i think that's also something that really is what it is so i love that you felt the same thing but i, I wanted to ask my like what, what, what I'm very interested in is in my smart contracts as have been written by um, um, uh, well, Monograph, right? Is that um, I maintain, I hold the copyright. This is addressing what 
Sylvain said also. I maintain and hold the copyright. I have the right to show the work whenever I want, no matter who bought it. So for example, the piece that was bought from Christie's is currently in two museum shows, right? But I didn't have to ask to do that. And I think what Sylvain brought up about would if the collector have to ask me, that's, I never really thought about that. And, and the other thing that made me, um, gave me, so I have drawings and the drawings of which were pages of a book, but also exist as watercolors, right? Drawings drawn, handmade by me. And then the copyright. Right, so the book out of print, I want to remake the book, or what is the artwork, the NFT is, these will be offered as NFTs. And then my idea was to give the drawings the whole, once they're all sold to a museum that collects me anyway, right? So the, then what's, what did I just do? <laughs> okay. Yeah. Uh, before Noish gives the answer, I have to uh, remind everybody of the time because the one hour has already. Um, yes, we we are to the times up for the for for the panel, actually. But why don't we just take this chance to take Claudia's question to go in to move on uh, onto the the Q and A part? And so Claudia was actually asking the first question to Noish. I guess uh, most of the questions might go to Moish because uh, you know, we certainly have many questions about the legal part and then the policies, governmental policies and taxation. Um, but of course, there might be other questions about the conservation and the museum part. So Moish, please go ahead. So now uh, Q&A, if anyone has the Q&A, have the questions, please feel free to post on our chat part. Yeah, feel free to put questions into the, the chat or there's the Q&A box as well. Uh, there's already been a couple that have come in throughout the um, last hour that we'll try and get to. Um, and then Claudia, I think it's, it's, for me, it's fascinating, right? Because if you have this set of expectations, right? You've been working as an artist for, and, and this is how it works traditionally. Well, so why, why should the fact that it's being sold as an NFT change any of it? Right, um, you know what? What are the default rules, and and have they changed? Um, and I think I, I think I do sense that that on the one hand that there there shouldn't be right like a, much of it like this is how I was always doing it. Like if I sold, if I drew a, a large painting and I and I sold it, then you know I retain the copyright, but the buyer of it gets the physical painting and can put it in their uh, living room, but they can't just start. You know, mass producing hundreds of copies of it, right? That's that's one of those rights. That's you didn't have to draft a contract to to say that. That's just one of those rights that's um, reserved, right? That that's assumed to happen without a contract. So, you know, now now we're talking about the the world of quote unquote smart contracts, and I, which I think is actually a misnomer um, and is probably ultimately going to create lots of confusion because a smart contract is is ultimately a piece of code. Now you can put in that piece of code, you know, description, terms of service, and link to terms of service. And I've seen all sorts of different things, but it it doesn't necessarily change that original. You know, Sylvan was talking about the, the idea of fair use, right? And there's certain uh, norms that have certain, that have always kind of gone with that. But I think it's it's also a question of what what is the norm now in an NFT purchase, right? You're you're, you're saying I sold an NFT, but now I'm doing certain things with the underlying work, like bringing it to a museum and doing exhibitions and things like that. And the, the, you know, I'm not saying you specifically, but you know, someone goes to Christie's and buys a $70 million piece of art and says, wait, no, why, why, are, why, is, why is people doing this with that? Or I, I bought the art at auction. I spent some, you know, so why, why don't I have? So I'm not sure that the, the consumer base necessarily knows what those rights are. And, and I think the question of what is a fair use, both is going to, relate back to the historical question of what fair use is. Um, but, but two, maybe we should be thinking about whether the, the expectations of the purchasers are, are, uh, or the collectors or, are, are, are now changing in this context or whether this context of smart contracts and APIs and computer code 
changes the expectations of what is or is not granted. So it, it, the question for me as a, as a lawyer is like, well, if that's all just implied and, and the question of fair use, fair use in the US at least is extremely unstable. Like there, there's like, you know, four or five decisions that have happened in the past maybe three to five months surrounding fair use that if you had pulled, uh, uh, you know, taken a poll of 100 intellectual property attorneys and asked which way the case was going to come out, they probably would have given you, uh, you know, probably either 50-50 or, you know, it, 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 would, it wouldn't, it, there's no real way to predict, right? So um, it, it's hard as, as an attorney to say, well, you have to rely on fair use. And, and there are obvious cases and there are not so obvious cases and there's cases in, in the middle, but, you know, for, for me as an attorney, it's like, well, don't you want certainty? Don't you want to put in the in the NFT itself? Here's the rights, and here's what you can do, and here's what you can't. But as hearing Sylvain with his comments, like, well, I don't want that as a collector. I don't want to be limited to what I can and can't do. And and hearing as an artist, you know, that might that doesn't sound very fun, right? Uh, to to put all sorts of uh, legal documents in there. So, anyways, that, that's that's kind of where I'm coming from, and and a lot of what I'm doing with with clients is working on, you know what what those platforms terms of service should look like what what you know if you're an artist or you're working with artists what rights you need to to execute a sale successfully um what rights are reserved and then in the artwork itself whether terms should be included in that but i, I think that all ties back to again what Sylvan was saying about you know what the value of the art is and whether adding restrictions is going to diminish that um, and whether, you know, 10 years from now, you know, is Ethereum going to be the leading blockchain? And if it's not, then what does it mean for all these really, um, you know, prominent and expensive artworks that exist only on the Ethereum blockchain? Um, and so if, if I if I bought a $70 million work of art on the Ethereum blockchain, can I wrap it and take it to the new blockchain 10 years from now? And is, is that a right I uh, hold by, by virtue of having bought it on, on one blockchain? Um, I, I don't know. Um, and I'll, I'll open that up to Juliet and then anyone else on the panel wants to comment on, on the legal aspects before I think we should take some comments from the audience. Well, absolutely. I was going to remind you, uh, save a little bit of your energies because I see two questions coming up for you and Sylvain, so uh, you will have a lot to, 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 to talk about. Uh, the first question comes from, uh, if I may, if I uh, pronounce well your name, sir, because I can't see you, um, Jose Carlos Casado. Uh, I, I, I apologize for my uh, very unskilled pronunciation. However, the question goes, what do you think of the huge difference in sale in uh, CryptoPunk comparing to quantum, historical quantum uh, is a historical, everybody knows historically, Recognized, recognized as the first NFT, what factors are determining the recognition, no, um, I'm sorry, recognition of NFTs? Uh, I, I guess, I guess if we uh, ask Sylvan to answer this question, he would say, I don't care, it's my passion. I love this artist, <laughs> right? But um, okay. Um, we're ready to hear your answer, Sylvain. You're on mute. The truth is a very difficult question because I have entered into this new world just a few months ago. You know, like everybody we discover uh, with the COVID, the NFT, uh, I think uh, it's becoming a, a, world, a world that is very hype. And so I like to go behind the hype and to try to understand so to tell you the truth, I don't think I'm the right person to answer to this question. I think I have to do a little bit more homework. I think that uh, uh, I think that uh, Claudia and John can can really uh, be, uh, uh, I think, uh, much more well placed to answer to this question. Uh, to tell you the truth, I mean, I, I think crypto punks, punks are really cool. They're considered, you know, the the first of the generation of of NFTs. So I think they they taken on an aura of well they're they're the they're the originals right they're the uh, uh so, so and and they also they they take on that sense of of being an avatar right so if you own one there's a status symbol behind that and that and that your ownership of that crypto punk serves as your online avatar and that's a certain type of status that i want to be a person that has a crypto punk 
or I want my friends to see that. Um, and so there's value behind that. Whereas, you know, well, quantum, maybe, maybe it's just the work. It's really cool, but it's just the work of art. It's not a, it's not a, doesn't have this whole history behind it where it, it provides status and, and value. And, you know, so what I think it still relates back to what is the value of art, right? Why are you collecting art in the first place? Um, I think it, it, it I'm curious what, what Claudia or John think. Well, I, I mean, we were talking about it right before we went live about the culture of NFTs. So Jose Carlos is a friend of mine. So that's how you pronounce his name. So um, what I would say is that it has to do with exactly what you're saying, Moish, is that the culture of the NFT space as it first started had to do with it's gamified. It's a gamified space. It's like finance, currency trading, gamified and mythologized. That's how it started. Now the, the, the artists speaking to the art history and into the future from past to future are entering the space, but it was there before as this gamified space. And that's what struck me as I've been meeting people who were within that space. Um, is everybody uses um, avatar names and the avatar persona, it's all mythologist, mythological. And um, there's a lot of mythological imagery and it has this, the cult of cryptography itself, you know, the Knights of the Templar thing going on. And, um, and then the, the, the crypto punks are just like you said, they're avatars. They are like the Knights of the Templar or something as pixelized. Of course it's worth $11 million. It's one of nine aliens and it's the only one with a mask. Like how could you even ask, right? And I mean, that, that's, that's the answer though, right? Right. It's an alien also. It's There's only alien. nine aliens. So that's one, it's the only one with the mask. So, you know, I think it speaks for itself. <laughs> All right, I have to play, always play the bad person. Uh, I have to cut you to here. I guess we can uh, continue the discussion in many, many hours after the panel because we have two questions coming up. And uh, I suggest that we stop with the third question. It, it was sent by anonymous attendee. Uh, and we, we, we will stop there. We can no more accept more questions. So um, the second question is uh, comes from Lee Day. Uh, Silva, it's, it's a question for Silva and Moish, you two. Regarding copyright transfer and ownership, is there an ownership difference be, uh, with digital art vs. physical in that the digital work is in, infinitely reproducible if not controlled through copyrights? Moish first, then after I'll perhaps I'll complete. <laughs> So yeah, I'm looking at the question. Um, so I think that's 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 the question of what we were we were talking about, right? Is is what is that difference? Are are those norms that we all you know have, have been using you know pre NFTs? Are, to what extent are those just going to be grafted on to to NFTs? Um, I think the problem with that is there there are some new issues, you know, the, the, the open source pseudonymous uh, Im immutable aspect of them that, that raised new questions that perhaps didn't exist. But I think the flip side of that is, is it's also an opportunity, right? Because you, you think about, um, you know, I, I, I was, uh, you know, like the Napster days, right? Where, where a music file is infinitely uh, duplicated but if, if I'm a record label, if I'm a, a musician, I have no way to control that. I have no way to monetize that. Um, it's, and it's, you know, even, and, and then as a consumer, right? It's, well, even if I want to support the artist, right? There's, there's no direct way necessarily to, to do that. Um, it's, it's a digital, digital rights management question, right? Um, so I, I think in, in some ways the, the NFT, uh, uh, creates a huge opportunity for both the artists, um, for, for you know, or, or for companies that, that own IP or art, and, and also for users and people that want to have, uh, you know, 
to support those artists or, or enjoy their, their artwork, to have a direct relationship, right? You can create an NFT, you can monetize, you can sell it to your, your fan um, and they can support you or they can enjoy your work by doing that. And it's a way for you to re regain that, you know, digital uh, ownership, right? But in, in, a, in a way that is inherently commercial. So, uh, so the, the, uh, yeah, I guess that's kind of how I see that both both the, the downside and the upside to it. Help you, Ron. <laughs> back back on. Let's get you unmuted. Sylvain, you were mute. Yes, uh, you know, uh, to tell you the truth, for me, it uh, the core of the problem is uh, the notion of scarcity. You know, if you look at all the cultural good, a part of art is about a, a large distribution. When you speak of music, uh, books, uh, videos, uh, films, uh, the artists uh, base their economical models on not on scarcity, but on large distribution. And especially large distributions through the digital, I shall say digital world. Now we are dealing with the digital world where normally we should use the same, I shall say the same ecosystem of a large distribution, but we want to adapt to this world, the old model of uh, the art world. So there is a problem. I don't have the solution, but there is a problem. Uh, this problem exists since Benjamin Franklin with the production of the artwork. But I think it's becoming more and more a problem because of the monetary and other issues. And to tell you the truth, I don't see how it will be solved. I'm very curious to see what will be uh, in this new world with these new types of consumer, I shall call them like this, and this new world type of artworks I shall say, produce products. I call it like this, if I can call it like this. I, I'm very. Uh, I, I really like. Would like to see what will happen, and I'm not sure that we are, you know, uh, having the right solution uh, by just authentication. I think we have to rethink the whole model at a certain time of what this. What is the distribution of the artwork and. Uh, what is uh, the position of an, an artist and a collector and, uh, and the other key players. And uh, okay, I'm not going to give any, any solution, but I think this is the, uh, for me, the, uh, the, the issues that uh, I think we will have to face. Shall I, shall I move on? Thank you, Sylvain. Shall, shall I move on uh, to the last question? Yeah, I think so. I don't know who will be able to answer this, but uh, this is a sensitive question that we have already mentioned just now. Do you think it's problematic for this new market that there seems to be a relatively small group of NFT collectors with a lot of money, smaller than the usual art world may, may be? And those name whales, um, oh, I'm sorry. Those same whales are heavily invested in the success of the blockchain economy. How much does this feel like a big marketing project? Well, in addition to this, uh, I can give some complementary information that uh, these big whales are also investing in the top art museums recently. Uh, from the news I read, uh, some of them donated NFT collection to prominent museums and some others um, donated um, uh, money to the museum. So is it a good move and is it normal that this small market is controlled by a small group of whales? This is our last question. Yeah, I can speak generally to, to the, the, the crypto whale and, and the marketing project side. Um, and then I would love to hear the everyone else's take on on it from a artistic side um so i, I think definitely the the cryptocurrency and everything in cryptocurrency you got to take everything with the big grain of salt i think um but both you know it's a hyper volatile asset class in terms of everything going up and down and uh trying to to monetize things on like a moving 
uh, landscape there. But I, I think everyone, you know, you, the people sale, right? $69 million, it seems like that whole thing was suspect. A lot of these sales seem that, that there's, there might be something else going on, right? So I, I think you always have to be a little skeptical, um, everything in cryptocurrency, right? Um, but on the same token, it's, good, it's, it's quite obvious that there are very high net worth people now that um, have high net worth in cryptocurrency. Um, and so it's a new class of uh, consumer, right? They, they have high net worth uh, cryptocurrency. They believe the reason they have that is because they believe in the project or they got in early. And so they're, they're invested, they're interested, um, and they want to keep their money, I think, in large part um, in cryptocurrency. And so they're spending their cryptocurrency on things within the cryptocurrency economy that have meaning to them, like art, right? Um, that that can, they can enjoy their status as, as a cryptocurrency person uh, that way. So I'm, I'm curious, you know, for the panelists, what you think about that and, and whether that changes, you know, do you, do, you, do you think about making art for that kind of person? Do you ignore it? Do you, I mean, is this different from the, the patronage model of the, of the Renaissance where you know, it's, it's, it's a, a much more unequal uh, model, right? Uh, because there's, there's very high net worth people and if they're the only people that can afford things and you're not able to sell to regular consumers and it's all sorts, it's, it's, it's an even bigger issue. But John, why don't we do John, Sylvan and Claudia and then we'll, we'll wrap up and hopefully by, by 1.30. You can go, Claudia. I think you had something. There's one. Um, I mean, is it that different from the regular art world when you talk about the dominance of certain um, collectors who are sit on boards of museums and what gets shown in a museum has to do with those people? Um, that's number one. But I don't think it is. But number two is the weird thing is an anonymity because I would say, this is probably true for you too, like people who collect digital, they're not, they weren't giant speculators. They're more like Sylvan doing it for love. And I know them <laughs> and I have conversations with them. I mean, and now there are people who I don't know even who they are. I don't know their names. And somehow that's different, very different. Yeah, I think we see a pattern that's uh, common in a, a market, uh, also in, in nature, that there's usually a few very large things and a certain number of medium sized things and a whole bunch of small things. <laughs> it sounds like sometimes how it breaks out. And one of the criticisms of the NFT space uh, trying to be so uh, decentralized was that it was mimicking the patterns. But I think it's uh, for me, and it, and it was also talked about when the, when the uh, web first came on this whole long, long tail idea that there'll be a few uh, stars and then there'll be, but there'll be much more uh, out, out there on the tail for, for people to do. There'll be more access to people like because of cryptocurrency, and because of the fluidity of the transactions and the and the um, relative low cost of uh, transferring currencies, uh, you know, you have a worldwide market where you may never had have had one before, and you don't have the friction of distribution of physical objects. So, uh, yeah, it, on the high end, a few people are buying things for whatever reasons they have. Uh, they have a lot of cryptocurrency, or they want some certain kind of status, or they want to build up an artist for many reasons, but there's also going on out there much more uh, on all, all sorts of levels and in all sorts of ge geographies that I think uh, uh, makes it a, a broader and much more interesting market. In the art world, uh, there is a lot of shooting stars. Uh, you know, I've been in the art world for 70, uh, 37 years and I've seen a lot of shooting stars in the art world. And so, uh, you know, once again, uh, you have to make your own journey as a collector uh, and you let the others do whatever they want. And, uh, and that's it. And uh, it's not about judging the others. I think everybody has its own agenda. If someone wants to spend money on, to, on something, a lot of money, because he has a lot of money, his problem It's not my problem. And I really don't care. I think that what is important is that an, a collection is a journey, a personal journey. 
it's not linked to objects. And uh, I, I'm not speaking by love, you know, I'm speaking by uh, the fact that uh, the, uh, for me, a collection is not about passion, it's about the way to look at things, about the way to encounter people, and also about the way to look at the, the, the society with the eyes of your time. And NFT is part of the eyes of our time. Uh, I'll try to take the best part of it. Uh, I'm not sure that I will succeed, but at least I think NFT is here to stay. Uh, there will be a lot of different types of NFT. And uh, the other thing which is interesting with NFT for me is that it gave the chance to put the, the light on artists who before were totally ignored. And, uh, and I think this is very important that uh, we have this kind of, you know, new uh, generation of artists or new types of artists uh, who are not the usual suspects. And I think this is something very, very important. And I encourage you to keep on doing what you're doing uh, because I think that we need also to have a diverse voice in the art world. Even well, this voice has to be stronger. Thank you so long. That, that's a perfect note to wrap on. Um, I, I think we've we've covered a lot today and hopefully given everyone a lot to think about. Um, thank you so much to Juliet for co-moderating with me and for uh, bringing in our uh, spectacular panelists. I, I, I know I learned a lot. John, Sylvan, Claudia, thank you so much for, for joining us uh, today, spending time with us, and thank you everyone for attending. And uh, until next time, this is part one of two. So uh, we will be sending everyone information about part two. And uh, until then, uh, good luck and, and have a nice weekend, everyone. Thank you. Thanks, Thanks everyone.